Come All right, on. here we go. Here we go. How many have been to Seattle? All right, that's great. Yeah, Mount Rainier, Space Needle. What I want to talk about is um, two different paths to addressing uh, creating healthy communities. And the first path is the path of service delivery. And the other path is Burger Crock. <laughs> <laughs> and both are absolutely essential. But they're two very different paths. The path of service delivery is led by agencies. Burger Crock is led by associations. Service delivery, we have different classes of people. We have the professionals and the volunteers and the clients. In Burger Crock, we're all citizens. In service delivery, it's top down. Burger Crock is democratic. Service delivery focuses on needs. Burger Crock focuses on the gifts that everybody has to offer. And Burger Crock is, or, I'm sorry, service delivery is totally dependent on money. And Burger Crock is dependent on relationships and care. And as I said, both are absolutely essential. The problem in our society is that over time, we've had more and more and more service delivery and less and less and less Burger Crock. I often talk about the relationship between crisis and opportunity. The good news is we got lots of opportunity for change right now. Yeah. Bad news is <laughs> we got lots of crises. And the first crisis we're facing is a crisis of our democracy. That's pretty apparent if you look at the United States, where we actually shut down our federal government. This is uh, one of many demonstrations I organized against our local government when I was a community organizer. But even here, I see a huge crisis, where you have fewer and fewer people voting, and more and more people think of themselves as taxpayers rather than as citizens. I do work in Beijing, and Beijing has taxpayers. Only democracies have citizens. And I think people are really starting to rediscover that our, that our democracy is in an incredible state of crisis. And people are starting to rediscover citizenship. And local government is starting to rediscover democracy. Second major crisis we're facing is the economic crisis. The very time people's needs are the greatest, our agencies of all kinds, local government, nonprofit organizations, have the fewest resources to respond. So people are starting to rediscover that there are incredible untapped resources in our communities. Third major crisis we're facing is the crisis of climate change. And I think we're starting to realize we're not going to make it if it's just about top-down solutions. People actually have to change the way they live. And I think people only do so if they feel some, some sense of connection with each other and the place they share. If you think of yourself as one individual, what difference does it make if I don't act responsibly? I'm one person on this huge planet. But it's in community that we feel that our actions are going to make a difference. So I'd like to share a story. This is from our Bower neighborhood of Seattle. Seattle has about 700,000 people, but our neighborhoods are more like the scale of 5,000. And the uh, story I'm going to share is from a program I'm going to describe later, which is our Neighborhood Matching Fund, a program that provides a cash match from local government in exchange for the community's equal match of volunteer labor in support of community-initiated projects. So Ballard was the neighborhood of Seattle that had the least number of street trees of any neighborhood in Seattle. It also had the fewest number of parks of any neighborhood outside of downtown. And there was a woman there named Dravilla Gowan. She cared passionately about trees. She wanted to see trees up and down the streets. So she put notices in her church bulletin. She put them in the corner of the grocery store. She put them in the Ballard News Tribune, advertising for other people who shared her passion for street trees. And she tried to find somebody at every block in Ballard. If nobody came forward, she'd go to that block and knock on every door until she convinced somebody they shared her passion for street trees. <laughs> then she got that person to sign a pledge for him, saying, I'll come to a training about how to plant and take care of the trees. I'll recruit my neighbors to do the same thing. <coughs> 
She turned in all of her uh, uh, the pledge forms with her matching fund application, and one day, trucks pulled into our neighborhood with 1,080 trees. Dropped them off at every block in Ballard. Dervilla knocked on the door of the block captain and said, the trees are here. Block captain knocked on the neighbor's doors. That day, over 1,000 people came out and planted trees up and down the streets. People felt incredibly empowered. Beginning of the day, there's no street trees. At the end of the day, they had tree-lined streets. Look what we can do when we work together as a community. They said, well, this is cool, but we still have the least number of parks of any neighborhood in Seattle. So they walked around the neighborhood looking for potential park sites and had a hard time finding them because the neighborhood is pretty developed. They finally found an old rundown house used to serve as a nursery. Property was overgrown. Huge public safety problem right next to the business district. They convinced our local government to buy that property for a park. We had some open space bond money to buy the property, but absolutely no money to design or build the park. So the neighbors did it themselves. Local landscape architect volunteered her services, worked with the other neighbors, and together they designed and built Baker Park, all with volunteers. This is the entranceway into the park, some of the landscaping. There were some beautiful old trees in this park, and one of them had died. They're trying to figure out how to remove it. And then one of the neighbors who was Native American had a better idea, and he carved it in place as a totem. And here's some of the detail. This group went on the next year, and they tore up all the asphalt around the school. They call it a gray to green project. Much better for the environment. The water can percolate through the soil. And it creates green space for the kids and for the neighbors. Now we do it around all our schools. But it's another one of those innovations that starts with the community. This, is, uh, this was planted as a street. It's owned by a transportation department. There's houses on either side, but it was never developed because it's too steep. Cars could never make it to the top. So as a result, the property just became overgrown. Huge problem with rats. The only thing it tried to get up were four-wheel drive vehicles. They'd challenge each other in the middle of the night, race their engines, see if they could make it to the top. Drive the neighbors totally crazy. Finally, the neighbors went out with picks and shovels, dug through that heavy hard pan clay soil by hand, hauled those timbers up the side, terraced that whole problem hillside, and turned that problem property into a community garden. This is now one of 85 organic community gardens we have in the city of Seattle, all built by neighbors, 7,000 urban gardeners. Collectively, they donate three tons of organic produce to our food banks every year. This is the group's most recent project, site of another former house. So to commemorate the house, they built all the furniture out of cement. And at the dedication of this park, they unveiled a timeline that shows the 20 parks they built over the past 20 years. Every one of them with volunteers. They built ball fields. They're renaturalizing natural areas. They built playgrounds. They're restoring a salmon estuary. They worked with the kids to build a skate park. 20 parks in 20 years, all volunteer, one neighborhood. They said, well, this is great. We made our neighborhood a much better place. We're concerned about what's happening to the planet. We're concerned about climate change. So they organized an all-volunteer group called Sustainable Ballard. And every summer for the past 10 years, they've had a Sustainable Ballard Fest where they have music and food to bring people into the local park. And then they have booths to educate neighbors about what they can do to reduce their carbon footprint. And the first booth you go to is the undriver's license station, <laughs> where you check all the ways you will not drive over the next month. And when you do, you get a laminated undriver's license, <clears throat> which entitles you to drive the shuffle bus. <clears throat> <laughs> this is a foot-powered mobile. It's kind of like Fred Flintstone going down the streets. Gets everybody's attention. Gets people thinking, what could I do to get out of my car? What could I do to reduce my carbon footprint? This now has created a movement. All the, all the neighborhoods around Ballard have organized their own all-volunteer sustainability groups. All the suburban communities around Seattle have done the same. We now have 67 of these all-volunteer organizations, and collectively they call themselves Scallops, sustainable communities all over Puget Sound. And it all started with their villa gown and the street trees 20 years ago. There's incredible untapped potential in our communities. And I think it's the only way we're going to deal with climate change. 
Same way, Mark, we said, whatever the question, community is the answer. There's clearly a role for local government. There's clearly a role for nonprofit organizations. But there's absolutely no substitute for community when it comes to the things we care most deeply about. If we're involving the community because of the economic cuts, we're doing it for the wrong reason. This isn't about how do we get volunteers to backfill for what professionals do. This is about doing work in a very different way, in a community way. And recognizing there's the things we care most deeply about are best done by community. When it comes to caring for one another, preventing crime. Police officers can enforce laws, but only communities can prevent crime. We spend way too many resources lining up the ambulances at the bottom of the cliff. When community's job is to build the fences at the top. Responding to disaster, both Kobe and Christchurch are sister cities of Seattle. I was in both places after the earthquake. They said the number one lesson they learned, there's no substitute for people knowing each other. But people often learn it when it's too late. Promoting health, studies show that about 15% of health outcomes can actually be attributed to healthcare professionals. In many ways, our communities can have a much bigger impact on our mental health, on our behaviors, on the social, economic, environmental conditions that impact our health. Our local economy, great places, all dependent on strong communities. Social justice, in my country, no major social changes ever come top down. It all comes bottom up. Civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, disability rights movement, the gay lesbian rights movement, the environmental movement, the anti-war movement, every major change comes bottom up. So without strong communities, we can't make change. And our very democracy is dependent on strong communities. The problem is at the time we most need our community, our community itself has been in its greatest state of crisis. How many of you know Robert Putnam's work? Yeah, a professor at uh, Harvard University wrote a book called Bowling Alone. The most depressing book of all for those of us who believe there's no substitute for community. Where he tracks the incredible breakdown of community life in North America over the past 50 years. And as I travel around Holland, I see the same forces at work here. Single purpose land use. Used to be we'd live, learn, work, and play on the same place. Now we have single purpose places, bedroom communities where we just go to sleep. Might drive a half hour to the mall, we're losing our main street. Might commute an hour to work. Since we have many different communities, but no community at all. People are increasingly mobile. More time working. Fear in many places. Electronic screens of all kinds. Globalization, where decisions and products are made further and further away from where we live. And I think most distressing, the very agencies that are trying to help our communities, local government, nonprofit organizations, are inadvertently contributing to the breakdown of the very communities they're trying to help where we have more and more and more professionals doing for communities what they used to do for themselves. And where the strength of every agency is it's organized into silos with a laser-like focus on its function, on its mission, on its expertise. But it makes it absolutely impossible to work with communities. We've created one set of silos for the old people. We get another set of silos for the young people. We get another set of silos for the dis people with disabilities. We've got another set of silos for the new immigrants. And you can't build community in silos. Who's serving whom? Where our communities are having to organize themselves the way our agencies are organized. Pretty depressing, sir. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I'm, gonna, I'm a hopeful guy. So I'm going to talk about the major changes I think we need to make because of the crises to reconnect communities and local agencies of all kinds. Because I think we need both, as I said at the beginning. This isn't just a question about how do we get community to substitute for agencies. It's about getting the best of both. Three major paradigm shifts I think we need to make to move in this direction. One is to get out of the silos. In the city of Seattle, we had 32 departments of our local government, each one doing its own outreach around its function. In addition to that, we had our county government with all its departments state government, federal government, hundreds and hundreds of nonprofit organizations. Each one tried to reach out and engage the community. They're being engaged to death. There aren't enough nights in the year to go to all those meetings. 
And that's not the way anybody experiences their community. It's in community that everything comes together. So if we want to work successfully with communities, we need to get out of the silos and start coming together and seeing how we can focus on the place rather than on the function. How do we work as one government? How do we work across all of the not-for-profit not organizations? One of the ways we did that in Seattle is in 1988, we formed the first ever Department of Neighborhoods. First time we'd organized the department the way the people were organized, by neighborhood. And it allowed us to do work in a very different way. Now, the mayor who appointed me was actually opposed to having a Department of Neighborhoods. That may be why he appointed me. The only interaction I had with the mayor before he appointed me was when we had picketed his house <laughs> and released the live chicken in his office because he'd backed down on a campaign commitment. <clears throat> so uh, he'd actually been opposed to having the department. But one of the reasons he was opposed was he said if we create a department of neighborhoods, it'll let all the other departments off the hook. And they can just keep doing business as usual. Because now we have one department responsible for working with the community. So that was a really good signal to me. And I realized I need to work across all the departments and not just with the neighborhoods. So the idea became, how do we get all the departments to think about themselves as departments and neighborhoods? So we made resources available to the other departments to help them work more effectively in more of a place-based kind of way across all the departments. And one of the key resources we put in place was a program of little city halls, storefront offices where people can do business with government right in their own neighborhood in our neighborhood business district. The reason there's a security glass here is we collect a lot of money, $50 million a year in each center, because you can go in there and apply for a passport. You can go in there and get a bus pass, even though that's a different layer of government. You can go in there and pay your parking or traffic fines. If you want to argue your traffic fine, the court magistrate makes the rounds, and you can have a hearing right in your own neighborhood rather than having to go downtown, risk a second ticket while you're trying to take care of your first one. <laughs> But the key resource we have in each of these little city halls is somebody we call a coordinator. Somebody who works for the Department of Neighborhoods, but works across all of the different departments and all the different nonprofit organizations. So if an individual or an association has an issue, they don't have to go all to all the separate service providers. They go to one person to find out how do we get our needs met. And that person is also connected with all the different networks in the community. Because it's not like there's one community. There's all kinds of factions. So they know all the groups, not just the resident associations. They know the faith-based groups, the school-based groups, the senior groups, the youth groups, the uh, service organizations, all those informal associations, and they bring them together in what's called a district council. So they can start to meet each other, develop consensus, and it's much easier then for government to partner with the community. They often refer to themselves as overt double agents. Really clear, they're working for both government and the community. And their job is just to help bring the two together. Second major paradigm shift we need to make if we're going to uh, partner with communities is to move away from this map of the places with which we're working and start focusing on this map. I often say that agencies and professionals need needs. It's a good thing we have needs in the community, or a lot of people here would be out of work. And it's a good thing we have professionals, because there's some things communities don't do so well. But oftentimes, in our desire to help communities, the first thing we do is do a needs assessment to figure out what are all the problems? How can we be most helpful? The problem is we often stop there, and we forget about this map of the same place, which is all its strengths. And this is the basis for partnership. If all we're doing is focusing on what's missing in the community, all the power is with the professionals. The community's really not bringing any value to the table. And over time, the communities have started to internalize this map that we've created of them. And they're always looking outside the community for all the answers. So the basis for partnership is to start focusing on the strengths that are in every community. One of the ways we did that in Seattle is we created this program called the Neighborhood Matching Fund. And the idea was to meet neighborhoods halfway on projects that had been a priority for the community, but hadn't been a priority for City Hall. It's part of the reason our neighborhood groups are so angry. They said city government's always putting their money into projects for big developers downtown, and never enough into our community priorities. 
And our government's excuse was, look, if we did that project for your neighborhood, we set a precedent. We'd have to do it for all the neighborhoods. We can't afford to do it for all the neighborhoods, so we're not going to do it for anybody. So I said, for projects like that, projects have been a priority for the community, but not for local government, how about if we meet them halfway? How about if we provide a cash match in exchange for the community's equal match of volunteer labor, originally valued at $10 an hour? And how about if we make this fund available to any group of neighbors so you don't have to go through those gatekeepers, those little mayors that keep everybody else away? Just any group of neighbors that wants to come together to do a project. You don't have to be incorporated. Just any group of neighbors. And how about if we just fund one-time projects because we want to build capacity rather than creating dependence. So we aren't going to fund staff or operating costs. And how about if all the funding decisions are made by the neighborhood leaders themselves? Took this idea to our city council. It was very controversial. Why should we put any money into projects that aren't our priority? We don't have enough money for everything that is. Finally, at a vote of five to four, they approved $150,000 for the first year. Those projects were so popular. We funded 22 projects with that money. And they were so popular, the next year, our council voted unanimously to increase the fund to $1.5 million. And they subsequently increased it to $4.5 million a year. This year, we celebrate the 25th anniversary of that program in Seattle. Over that time, more than 5,000 community self-help projects have been completed. There's evidence of them in absolutely every neighborhood, greatly reinforcing what's special about that place, contributing to the quality of life. The city's $60 million investment over the years has leveraged $85 million in community resources that under the old model, where people are looking to government to do everything, never would have been tapped. But the best benefit is it's newly involved tens of thousands of people in community life because we've finally given people a way to get involved other than going to meetings. And believe it or not, not everybody likes to go to meetings. <laughs> it's usually the only option we give them. If you really care about your community, you're going to come to our meeting. But people don't see results. Right? And people, people get involved in projects that are so different than meetings. Unlike meetings, it's not a life sentence. Unlike meetings, there's always a result. Unlike meetings, there's a role for everybody. Young people, elders, people with disabilities, artists, construction workers. And in the process, people build relationships. Once people build relationships, then they're more likely to come to a few meetings. Because you need a few of them. But we always lead with the meetings and wonder why the same people keep showing up. So I want to show you some examples of projects. Every one of our playgrounds in Seattle, both in our parks and our schools, has been redeveloped by the community through the matching fund. It used to be every one of our playgrounds looked exactly the same. I think our parks department got a good deal. right? Now each one reflects what's special about that place. So the first playground to be developed was in the Alki neighborhood. And when the neighbors showed up for the design meeting, some of the kids showed up in, whe in wheelchairs. So they built the first wheelchair accessible playground in Seattle. Again, we see innovation coming out of community. This is one of the most recent playgrounds. This is a site of a, um, where, where neighbors had worked for 20 years to clean up Piper's Creek to make a better salmon habitat. They were finally successful in getting salmon to come back to the city of Seattle. They said, now we've got salmon back, we want kids back. We need a playground. So they had a design meeting, and one of the kids said, I want a salmon playground. The adults are all scratching their heads, nobody had ever seen one before. But finally an artist said, I've got an idea, and he built a 19-foot-long salmon that's so big, you slide in the mouth and you come out the tail. Here's where you go in, and here's how you come out and you land in a foam rubber sea. All kinds of facilities have been renovated by community volunteers. This is a log cabin that was riding away in West Seattle. And the neighbors uh, uh, renovated this to become an historical museum. We don't just fund neighborhood communities. We also fund communities of color because oftentimes immigrants and refugees identify with their culture before they identify with a particular place. So this is our Eritrean community that was concerned they were losing their kids to the streets, getting involved in gangs. So they used the matching fund to build their own cultural center. Been incredibly successful at bringing be kids back into their community. This is in our Soto neighborhood, warehouse and industrial area just south of downtown Seattle. Backs of the warehouses were covered with graffiti. There was trash all along the tracks. And this is the gateway into Seattle, first view that tourists and commuters get of Seattle each day. It looked terrible. 
Mike Perringer here worked in the local factory. He was embarrassed about this image of his neighborhood. He had a great idea. He says, why don't we see the backs of the warehouses as potential canvases for murals? He called it the Urban Art Corridor. But Mike had an even better idea, and he worked with our court system, and he asked the judges, can you offer the kids who get busted for graffiti an alternative sentence where they could come and help us to create the murals? So young people create every one of these murals. And we found that as long as the kids were involved in this program, not one of them reoffended. The problem in Seattle is you can only paint outdoor murals three months a year because it's raining the other nine months. <laughs> <laughs> so Mike came up with another great idea, got a local warehouse to don donate their space, and in there they create murals and four by eight sheets of plywood. They put those around construction sites to beautify the construction sites. The developers pay for the murals, and it keeps the program sustainable over time. So now they've created over 1,500 murals, and more than 5,000 young people participated. This is in the Fremont neighborhood. Huge problem with drug dealing, and, um, um, uh, uh, drug dealing and illegal dumping under the bridge. I think any other neighborhood, they would have put fences up on either side to keep out the problem. Fremont has lots of artists. They had a different idea. They said, we want to put some public art under the bridge. I said, well, what's it going to be? They said, we don't know yet. Once we get the money, then we're going to put out a call for artists, and we're going to let the people decide. I said, man, we can't fund that. We don't even know what it is. <laughs> and this is the second year of the matching fund. It was still a very controversial idea. I said, that'll be the end of the matching fund. But as I said, neighborhood leaders make all the funding decisions, and they like this idea, so they agreed to fund it. I said, oh, my God, that's it for the matching fund. <laughs> so the, the community got the money. They put out a call for artists. Artists submitted models for what they wanted under the bridge. Somebody submitted a large throne because they were calling this the Hall of Giants. Somebody else submitted larger-than-life construction workers and engineers, kind of a tribute to the people who built the bridge. Somebody else submitted a troll. I thought, oh my God, how would I explain to the mayor that we're going to use public funds to build a troll under a bridge? We don't even have enough money to fill all the potholes. It'll be the end of the matching fund. So they got these sculptures, they, put them on, uh, they got models, they put them on display at the Fremont Fair. 100,000 people come by. They're entitled to vote for which sculpture they want under the bridge. I kept going by voting for those construction workers because I figured they're the least objectionable. Guess which one won? Yeah, my worst fear. Yeah. And it got a whole lot worse because a couple days later, the art critic from the Daily Newspaper wrote a scathing review. She says, this shows that people should never be involved in public art decisions. <laughs> people have no taste. This is kitsch. It's a terrible waste of public funds. But oh my God, that's it for the matching fund. <laughs> but her column so incensed the community, they started rallying behind the troll. They started doing street dances to raise money for the troll. <laughs> <laughs> the kids wrote a troll rap. <laughs> I went to the neighborhood one day. There were 10-foot-long footprints up and down the streets of Fremont like the troll had been walking through the neighborhood. <laughs> so they raised the money. They built the troll. Here he is. Oh. <clears throat> that troll is so big, that's a real VW he has in his claw. It's kind of an environmental statement, like you lifted the uh, car off the top of the bridge. There was some vandalism early on. Somebody broke out the window in the VW. But the neighbors organized. They formed a troll patrol. <laughs> they put lighting on the troll. They walk around the troll in the neighborhood every night, making sure the troll in the neighborhood are safe. Yeah. And it's what happens when people start to take ownership of their communities again. They don't just call up council and say, hey, there's problems with your troll. It's their troll. They watch out for them. And they're always using the troll. They do Shakespeare on the troll. When it's Halloween, they celebrate Trollowing in Fremont. Thousands of people come and they howl at the troll and they do processions through the streets. And now this troll brings people from absolutely all over the world. Here's proof. <laughs> and when they come, they shop in the local business district. And there's always legitimate activity underneath the bridge. So there's absolutely no problems with public safety. Not a solution that would have come out of our police department, right? Huge public safety problem under the bridge. Let's bring in the troll. Yeah. The third major paradigm shift 
is instead of always driving things top down, being open to supporting community initiatives. Now again, many times it's appropriate for agencies to drive things top down. You can't do transportation planning one neighborhood at a time. You don't want neighborhoods enforcing their own laws. But if we're going to partner with communities, we need to be open to community initiatives rather than always trying to get communities to do what we want them to do. So we need to move to community-driven ways. So one of the ways we do this in Seattle's community groups said, this is great, you've empowered us to do these projects, but if you really want to give us power, you give us the power to plan. So we said, if you bring all the stakeholders together in your neighborhood, everybody, all the different factions, we'll give you money to hire your own planner who's accountable to the community. But you have to have the whole community engaged in the planning process. So when the plan's done, it's owned by everybody, not just the planner. Result in a totally different kind of planning, where the community actually owned the plans. Where the community planned around what was important to them, rather than what the bureaucracy thought should be important to them. And where, there, and, and where when the plan was done, they were able to hold council accountable for implementation of those plans, but more importantly, took a lot of responsibility themselves. So here's just a couple of examples. This is in my neighborhood of Columbia City. Low-income neighborhood, multicultural, highest percentage of kids of any neighborhood in Seattle, but we didn't have any community center because we didn't have a voice with local government. Through the planning process, hundreds and hundreds of people got involved. So we had a huge lobby to push for change. And we got the city to build the largest community center in the city. But the reason I'm showing this picture is in the foreground, you see a ball field. My wife, as a volunteer, had organized girls' softball league. So girls had some recreational opportunities. We got it all organized and then realized there weren't any fields. So we built them ourselves, the kids and their parents. This is one of dozens of ball fields we built. We got the local school to open up at night for community use. Schools in my city are used about 15% of the time because their mission is just to educate young people. We said, let's get out of the silo. Let's open them up. So now we, people teach their skills for free in the classrooms at night. There's a cafeteria where we do community meals, gymnasium for community recreation, auditorium for community performances, computer center where kids are teaching their parents how to use a computer. We tore up the asphalt around the school and put in raised beds. Then the biggest issue in our neighborhood is we'd lost our main street. All the business has been boarded up. So through our neighborhood plan, our, our community said, we're going to take responsibility for revitalizing our business district. We painted a mural on the graffiti-covered wall that's the entrance into the community, celebrating what we love about our community. It's multicultural heritage. We, we fixed up the worst storefront in the business district, hoping other business owners would fix theirs up. And we turned it into a nonprofit bike store. And we got people to donate their used bicycles that hadn't worked for years. And we teach kids how to fix those bicycles. And every kid who graduates from the program earns his or her own bicycle. They've now formed a bicycle club. The older kids do the Seattle to Portland bike ride. We do annual bike swaps so as kids grow, they can swap for larger bicycles. Now, hundreds of kids have earned their own bicycle. They donate bicycles to foster kids, to homeless families. They're sending bicycles to the people of Africa every year. And this is out of a neighborhood that was seen as a place with nothing but needs. Well, despite this project and so many others, we converted an old church into a cultural center. We turned the parking lot of a closed supermarket into a farmer's market, all with volunteers. There was one block in this historic district we couldn't get any businesses to come into. It had been boarded up for 20 years. Finally, somebody said, look, if we can't get real businesses, let's pretend. They said, what kind of business would you like? Somebody said, I want an ice cream store. I want a toy store. I want a bookstore. I want a hat shop. I want a dance studio. So we painted the entire block to make it look like there were businesses. <laughs> People got excited. Cars were stopping. People wanted to get out and shop. <laughs> Within a year, we had to take down every one of the murals because real businesses wanted to get in on the action. So what it looked like one year later with an Italian deli, with a brew pub, with a co-op art gallery that also came out of the neighborhood plan. Go to Columbia City today, there's not one empty storefront. They're building new mixed-use development to keep up with demand. And everything that happened here came out of the community plan, using the community's resources. 
What do I have? Five more? Five. <laughs> nice. Five. <laughs> Five? Yes. Okay, I'm going to go fast. I've got to go really fast. Uh, one more point. Delridge. Uh, defined by an arterial way to get somewhere else. That a very low-income multicultural community, was a weak sense of community. They wanted to create a center to their neighborhood like everybody else had. They wanted to get the kind of public facilities that other neighborhoods took for granted. They wanted to preserve their environment. And as they made their neighborhood a better place, they wanted to keep it affordable. They didn't want to create a better neighborhood for somebody else, have it gentrified. They wanted to create a better neighborhood for the low-income residents who lived there. So this is what happened out of their plan. Volunteers cleaned up along the creek, revegetated with native plants, created a trail system along the creek, including this wonderful fishbone uh, bridge spanning the creek. They worked with new immigrants and refugees to build community gardens, market gardens, where they can sell the produce and make some income and make cross-cultural connections. Then in the center of their neighborhood, on a vacant lot, they said, this is where our, the center of our neighborhood is going to be, and we need a new library. Because they involved so many people in the planning process, they got the city to put up the money for the library. But before the city even had a chance, they designed that library themselves. And this is what they got. A library with 24 units of low-income housing up above it. Right. That's something that would never come out of our city government because our library department just builds libraries. And our housing department just builds housing. We get so much more holistic solutions coming out of the community. Their key recommendation was they had an historic school building, but boarded up for 17 years. The community voted to renovate that as a multicultural center, surround their young people with the arts. They raised the money to renovate this building's Youngstown Cultural Arts Center. They invited in the Interagency Academy, which is a school for kids that have been kicked out of every other school in Seattle, as the anchor tenants. They fixed up the old gymnasium as a state of the art movement studio. They fixed up the old cafeteria as a theater. And upstairs, they put 37 live-work units for low-income artists who help program the space down below with young people. Opening night, 3,000 people showed up to watch the kids perform because they all felt proud. They'd raised the money. It was their ideas, their kids who were performing. Incredible power in communities. But if we're going to move there, there's three major steps we need to take to start partnering with the communities. The first one is do no harm. <laughs> We don't want to rush right out there and help them. And we forget that inadvertently we're doing harm to the very communities we're trying to help. We're the ones who are always out there setting the priorities, setting the agenda. That's happening big time now. We're being told we've got to get the communities involved in care. So we're all going out there pushing the care agenda. Stupid. People are not going to volunteer for our agenda. They aren't going to volunteer to take the place of professionals. They're only going to get involved if we involve them around what they care most deeply about. And once they get involved and, and, and develop the relationships, you're going to get care. Don't force the community into the bureaucracy silos. Don't take people's time without showing results. All this consultation process, surveys, where people don't see any results from their efforts. They learn it doesn't pay to be involved. We've turned so many people off to sense of participation. Iron rule of community organizing, never do for people what they can do for themselves. Hardest rule for all of us to learn because we're doing this work because we care deeply about communities. But in our desire to help people, we're taking away their own capacity. Don't think of nonprofits as a surrogate for community. This is huge. More and more and more treating the nonprofits as if they are the community. They're starting to think of themselves as the community. They play a valuable role, but it isn't being the community. Nobody elected them. They're less accountable than government. Remove barriers to participation. Centralized decision making, where decisions are made at this level, communities are active at this level. Cookie cutter programs and regulations where in the name of efficiency and fairness, we treat everybody the same. Not recognizing the unique physical character of the place or the cultural character of the people. Inaccessibility, bureaucratic red tape, health and safety. Every city I go to, that's the thing stopping communities from doing anything. It's legitimate reasons, but we need to figure out how do we say yes rather than always using it as an excuse to say no. There are ways to say yes and cut through that bureaucratic red tape. Know-it-all attitude, again, not, ex not apologizing for our expertise, but recognizing there's incredible expertise in our communities, often of a different kind. And you bring those two kinds of expertise together, you get the best possible outcomes. And then finally, to build the community's capacity. Offer leadership training. 
Provide tools like translation. Work with associations of all types rather than just the usual suspects. The organizations are organized around our agenda. If we really want to reach out to everybody, we need to recognize all the ways people are organized in community. To provide forums for networking, to start bringing these associations together so they can build relationships, develop consensus, develop a common vision, offer non-meeting options for engagement, share stories, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so this is happening absolutely all over the world in Brazil. Participatory budgeting, building budgets from the bottom up. In India, village assemblies everywhere. In Japan, huge community building movement that came out of the Kobe earthquakes. In Taiwan, I got to speak at the graduation for hundreds of young people who are volunteering to be community leaders. In New Zealand, a huge community-led development following Maori concepts, Maori culture, Maori language. Huge movement happening in New Zealand. In Australia, you got to speak at a conference organized by the local government association called Power to the People. <laughs> How refreshing for local government officials to start thinking democracy might be part of its function. <laughs> and in the United Kingdom, big society. Said so because we don't have money, we're going to train 5,000 community organizers. They're replicating our matching fund across the country. But when I gave my talk at 10 Downing Street, I said, this is great. You've recognized the role for the community, but there's also a role for government. And it's crazy when you start saying we want the, the community to do what government does. They each have value, but they play different roles. And finally, here are the Netherlands with Burger Trot. <laughs> yeah! I am so excited about what's happening here. I was here just in March, and just the incredible change in the last few months. I've been all over the country, and everywhere I see community groups taking action. And I see government really working hard to try to be partners with them. It's tough. People are really complaining about all those rules. And I know a lot of the rules are forced on you from higher up. A lot of the targets are forced on you from higher up. But we've got to figure out how we get past that. Because we got, in, we got, I got a friend who says, you can't waste a good crisis. <laughs> and I'm serious. I mean, we, I don't, we aren't going to get too many more. We've got to make the most of this one. Okay? So thanks so much. Look forward to the discussions during the rest of the day. Burger Talk!